everyone. My name is Jeff Hunt, and I have the wonderful privilege of serving as the Vice President of Public Policy for Colorado Christian University, where I help direct our think tank, the Centennial Institute. Today, we are proud to welcome a great friend to the Centennial Institute, a true Western conservative, Representative Ken Buck. On his new book, Capital of Freedom, Restoring American Greatness, Congressman Ken Buck is a Republican from Windsor, representing Colorado's 4th Congressional District, who was first elected to Congress on November 4th, 2014, and is currently serving his third term in the United States House of Representatives. Ken serves on the House Judiciary Committee and the House Foreign Affairs Committee. He serves as the ranking member on the House Judiciary Subcommittee on Immigration and Citizenship and he also serves on the Subcommittee on Antitrust, Commercial and Administrative Law. He also serves on the House Foreign Affairs Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigations in Western Hemisphere, Civilian Security and Trade. It's very busy in Washington, DC. Ken Buck learned the value of hard work from his grandfather who opened a shoe repair store in Greeley in the 1930s. One of three brothers, Ken worked his way through high school, college, and law school as a janitor, truck driver, furniture mover, and as a ranch hand. After law school, Ken worked for Congressman Dick Cheney on the Iran-Contra investigation and then became a prosecutor with the U.S. Department of Justice. In 1990, Ken joined the Colorado U.S. Attorney's Office, where he became the chief of the criminal division. Starting in 2004, Ken Buck was elected Weld County District Attorney three times. He, had, he led his staff of more than 60 people with a strong record of criminal prosecution and crime prevention under Ken's leadership. The crime rate in Weld County dropped 50%, one of the best records in the country. I gotta tell you, if you've been paying attention to the news, the crime rate's going up in Denver, uh, up in places around Denver. Uh, we need that type of strong local leadership back in our local communities. Uh, Ken is a Christian and a leader in his profession and community. Ken's son, Cody, is a graduate of West Point and served in the U.S. Army. Ken's daughter, Caitlin, is a business executive in Colorado and a graduate of Clemson University. Colorado Christian University is a 501c3 and as such does not get involved in campaigns. This conversation is not about candidates or campaigns. Uh, we do not endorse or support or disparage any candidates. Uh, this is a conversation about issues. And the issues in this book, we do support. The issues like the original intent of the Constitution, the sanctity of life, personal freedom, free markets, uh, liberty, freedom, strong families, uh, the sanctity of life, all the good stuff. And so uh, we're grateful to be able to talk with Congressman Buck today about these issues in his latest book. Congressman Buck, welcome to the Centennial Institute. Congratulations on the new book. This is your second book, I believe. Uh, tell us about this uh, latest book. Well, it's a really exciting uh, project for me. I, I give tours of the Capitol at night. And what I've done is I've written a book uh, that features a particular uh, part of the Capitol and then uh, talks about the constitutional principle associated with that feature and then talks about where progressives are trying to take this country. And it is so fundamentally in conflict with what we know the, the, the founders intended and what history has demonstrated makes this country great. You know, I, I just finished reading your book. It's fantastic. I got to tell you what it reminded me of. All right. Uh, so Ken Buck is Nicolas Cage in National Treasure, uh, the movie. And uh, the National Treasure isn't some fortune to be found out there. It is a country full of liberty and promise and opportunity. And the secrets to that country are found all over the Capitol. You just need to look and you need to know why they're there. And if you find them, you find the secret to making America great. Uh, that was the sense I got out of your book. Well, thank you. I, it's a great sense to get out of a book. And, and I have to tell you, I give tours almost every night. And I would love to give people tours as they come to uh, the, the nation's capital uh, and give them a tour of the capital and, and make sure people appreciate it the way I do. Well, one of the things that you point out is that we've kind of lost the sense of what the capital is about, what the Constitution's about. You say that the truth is liberals have all but abandoned our Constitution and so-called conservatives largely ignore the Constitution 
everywhere but on the campaign trail. Can you expound on that, please? Sure. Well, I, Jeff, it's so important. As I got to Washington, D.C., I, I ran on this, this conservative platform of making sure that we uh, followed what the founders intended, and that is that, that the people controlled government, not the other way around. And I think it's so uh, valuable for leaders in government to understand that they derive their power from people, not just at an election, but every day, every decision should be made with that in mind. And, and so often what we see in Washington, D.C. are people doing things because special interests have uh, a, a financial benefit in it or, or people doing uh, a member's voting because uh, there, is, there is something for them in it as opposed to representing the people uh, in their district, in their state and, and in this country. One of the things I love about your leadership Ken, is that you were part of the House Freedom Caucus. Now we've had the House Freedom Caucus to the Western Conservative Summit. We've had you to the Western Conservative Summit just about every year you've been in office. Now I don't traditionally do that. I like to switch up speakers, but I always love to bring back you and the House Freedom Caucus because regardless of the party affiliation, you hold people accountable to the constitution and to not expanding the debt that we have in this country. And I've always admired about that. And so one of the things I like that you pointed out here was that sometimes even Republicans uh, lose their sense of the importance of the Constitution. And you, you have a track record of holding them accountable. Yeah, I think it's important that, that uh, uh, we, we all agree that uh, we cannot sustain the debt that we are uh, building right now with this deficit spending. And at some point, we either come to grips with it and, and uh, start reducing the national deficit or we end up uh, going over a cliff and, and uh, the bottom of that cliff is not uh, gonna be pleasant at all. And so I, I think it is, uh, and it's part of the Republican brand to be uh, in favor of small government, to be uh, a, a party that, that believes in uh, less government control, less government regulation. Uh, and, and too often we, we ignore that. We, we're fortunate to have a president in office now who absolutely recognizes the need to deregulate and has deregulated so much and, and to the benefit of our economy. Uh, and, and so I'm, I'm very fortunate that, that now uh, I am with some friends in Washington, D.C. Who, who get it. At the beginning of your book, you point out the story and basically your own personal experience of the impeachment trial uh, or the impeachment investigation that led up to the impeachment trial over on the Senate side. But you said how many progressive members of Congress walked by Lady Liberty on that fateful night in December 2019, willfully ignorant, uh, it willfully ignored her plea to remember the Constitution. Can you share with us what that was like being a member of Congress? while the president was being investigation was being investigated for uh, a possible impeachment sure I, I want to talk about lady liberty for a second if i can mm -hmm. uh, it's it's a beautiful statute i was uh, at a dinner my my uh, before my freshman term began it was during freshman orientation and the house historian pointed to this statute and in her right hand she has a scroll and that scroll is the constitution and the members used to sit in this room reminded every day that they should follow the Constitution. And here we are walking to the impeachment of a president, absolute sham, no basis for this impeachment, in fact, purely political effort to embarrass the president. And uh, member after member walked right under that statute, reminding us to follow the Constitution, and then it went in and cast a vote contrary to that, that concept. And it's really struck me at, at the time that uh, all people have to do is look around them and they would recognize what their duty is to the Constitution. Hmm. One of the things that you pointed out in your book that was actually kind of news to me, I'll be honest with you, because uh, I was probably ignorant about this. I thought there were three co-equal branches of government uh, <laughs> in our, our federal government. Uh, you point out that they are not co-equal. Uh, this, this will be a little interesting. Give me your thoughts on that. Sure. Well, the, the, the Supreme Court chambers were actually in the basement of the Capitol uh, at the beginning uh, of our country. And uh, they were in there, not just uh, symbolically underneath the legislative branch, uh, 
but also, uh, as a matter of fact, they were never intended to be co-equal. They were, uh, they, they, they have grown, and, and I start this analysis with Marbury versus Madison, where the Supreme Court grabs power and says, we are the final uh, decision maker when it comes to the Constitution. But uh, the reality is that uh, the founders saw um, the dangers of uh, individuals that serve lifetime appointments. They saw that in uh, the monarchy in England as well as uh, around the world at the time. And so they were very fearful that uh, the, the judicial branch in, in our government would be made up of lifetime of appointments. And so they called it uh, the least powerful branch of government, and yet it has become the most powerful. And, and ironically, what's occurred is the fight over Supreme Court justices was never meant to be as vicious as it is now. And it's only once the left decided to use the Supreme Court as a super legislature that we now see the dangers of actually having constitutional conservatives on the Supreme Court to the left. They can consider that dangerous because they can't enact policies by judicial fiat that they would like, that they can't get through the legislative branch. Well, in fact, you quote Lincoln in one point in your book, you say, Lincoln predicted what we have now, a Supreme Court, that eminent tribunal, as he put it, ruling beyond what it should. Now, I'll be honest with you, Congressman Buck, we, uh, we were big fans of Neil Gorsuch here. And uh, uh, we bought his book and we shared his book. His book talked about the importance of the legislative process, the importance of, of uh, getting groups together that have competing priorities and working through legislation to reflect the will of the people and the importance of compromise. And then lo and behold, he comes out with a decision in Bostock that redefines the word sex. Uh, and uh, I think a lot of us were frustrated. I think a lot of us see exactly what you're talking about, a Supreme Court that has way too much power to essentially be able to rewrite laws. Is that a question? <laughs> <laughs> I will tell you something, Jeff. My, my friend, Neil Gorsuch, and he is a friend, yeah. um, uh, deserves a mulligan just like the rest of us do. And, and I am, uh, you know, I, I disagree with his opinion. I think it's something that Congress was actually getting to, and, and you and I had had a number of discussions about uh, how to deal with, with the uh, marriage decision that came out of the Supreme Court and, and the implications for that. And really it's the legislative body that should be deciding those issues. And, and I think we were getting to it. Um, and, and we may not have gotten to it in the same way as the Supreme Court, but I think we would have gotten there. And, and I think the Supreme Court needs to be patient and needs to allow the legislature to uh, act in the way that uh, it the, the, the country was, in, uh, the legislative uh, process was intended uh, by our founders. Right, and you have a great quote in your book. You say, mind you, the legislative branch could get something wrong, but go back and fix it if need be. But when the high court creates an entirely new right, it also creates a slew of unintended consequences the other branches of government will have to fix. And uh, uh, we were talking with good friends uh, of uh, law firms that do religious liberty work. And as a result of the Bostock decision, there's going to be a whole sort of new lawsuits to figure out what that ultimately means. And I think that is unfortunate. Uh, you have a caucus you helped find, a bipartisan caucus that I'm interested in hearing more because I didn't know about this. But I would love for you to share more about it. The, Wars Pow the War Powers Caucus, whose purpose is to reaffirm Congress's duty on matters of war and peace. Can you tell us more about that, please? Sure, Jeff. And, and it's a really important caucus. Um, and, and it's ironic uh, in some ways, but it really it has the um, most conservative members on the right and the most liberal members on the left that are part of this caucus. And uh, for different reasons, we believe that, that war is uh, a, a tragedy and is something that should be engaged in really as a last resort. And our founders were so concerned about bankrupting the country over wars. And in some ways, that's exactly what's happened. And, and the decision to go to war, the decision to risk American lives, the decision to, to really risk our, uh, our prosperity as a country um, should not be taken lightly and it should not be made by a single person. Our founders saw that with a king that ignored the parliament and, and engaged in war. 
And we now have an executive branch that has war making powers that were never intended and go far beyond the constitutional uh, powers. And so the, uh, the War Powers Caucus is intended to bring decisions regarding war back to the legislative body uh, where they can be debated and, and, and thoughtfully debated. And this doesn't mean that if there is an, a, an attack on the United States that uh, you know, we have to ask our adversaries, hold off for a few hours, you know, Congress has to convene and have a debate on this. That's not what's intended at all. The president has the authority for 90 days to, to react to any uh, incident in, in the world. Um, but after 90 days, he can't engage. And, and I say this about President Obama, uh, former President Bush, President Trump. Um, the president can't engage in hostilities without authorization from Congress. And it really does two things. One, it complies with the Constitution. But secondly, uh, future Congresses will be reluctant to defund war efforts when Congress actually was in the decision-making process and approved of the original uh, um, uh, hostilities, engaging in hostilities. And, and so I think it's so important that, that we, uh, as, as a legislative body, undertake these decisions. What I see with you, and as well as with Neil Gorsuch and kind of the conservative movement on the Supreme Court, is that we've got to get power back to the legislative branch. Whether it's executive or judicial, they've usurped too much power. And really, it's the people's house where the debates need to take place, where, the, uh, where you've got to get people in a room and they've got to go through the legislative process that's really important to get our country back focused there, because really, the legislative branch should be the most powerful uh, branch of government. It seems like that's an important part of your book. It is an important part of my book. And, and Jeff, I'm so happy that you raised that because really I talk about separation of powers. And if you look at the design of Washington, D.C., where the Capitol is, the Capitol sits on a hill. If you look at our Constitution, Article 1 talks about legislative power. Um, if you look at the uh, mall, the mall is designed to uh, accommodate public gatherings where the public actually uh, has the opportunity to address members. If you come see me in Congress, you walk through a magnetometer, but that's the only restriction. You can come into my office and you can, if I'm in a vote or something, you can wait for me and you can talk to your representative in Congress. You can't walk into the White House without an appointment. You can't walk into the Supreme Court without an appointment. You can walk into Congress. We are meant to be the most accessible branch uh, and, and also the most representative branch in government, and we should be making the decisions as a result of that. Your prescription to get us back includes really focusing in on a, uh, on a number of rights that we've got to make sure that we strengthen, the freedom of press, local control, religious freedom, the Second Amendment. Uh, one of the things I enjoyed about your book was that you reveal that there's all, pretty much always been a tension between press and elected officials, uh, and that this wasn't something new to just Trump. Uh, in fact, Obama uh, waged in many ways uh, Nixon-like tactics to go after the press. Even he had press issues, but still the pre freedom of press matters, as well as religious freedom, as well as the Second Amendment. Uh, I know we've only got a few minutes with you. Uh, you've been in the public because of your support for the Second Amendment. Uh, you have a gun in your uh, office there. Can you share a little bit of that story? Uh, sure. I, it was a gift, and uh, I had to go through months of, of ethics investigation and, and approval for the gift, and uh, uh, I then got permission from the Capitol Police to display it in my office, and I got permission from the D.C. Police to bring it from the uh, National Airport in, in Virginia into my office, and I got permission from TSA to bring it on the plane. Um, I got all those permissions in writing, and I took a picture with my good friend Trey Gowdy and, and put that picture up uh, on Facebook, and uh, the uh, Democrat operatives called the uh, uh, chief of police in, in Washington, D.C., and said, if you knew a congressman had an AR-15, would you investigate? And of course, they're going to investigate because they, didn't, they weren't told that it was in my office. They weren't told that they had already given me permission. So uh, they said, yes, the Washington Post writes a story that a uh, congressman under federal firearms investigation, um, when I explained everything to them, they, uh, they understood, but they kept the story up, of course, because of the Washington Post, but um, I, I thought it was just, uh, you know, emblematic of the issues. This is a gun that has been disabled, and yet 
the left just goes crazy thinking that that uh, you know we have guns that are part of our culture and and really a necessary part of everyday life in in the West. There are predators in the West. And, and we need to make sure that we protect our livestock as well as our families. And uh, even if you just want to go and, and uh, hunt your protein, uh, you're, you're allowed to have a gun. And, and really, uh, our forefathers uh, encouraged gun ownership and gun safety and, and knowledge about uh, guns because it was a national security issue as well as a personal property right. That's right. Uh, in your intro, uh, Mike Lee writes the foreword to your book, and he mentions the term, which I love, that you all are both Western conservatives. Uh, I think this is something that needs to be more defined, more fleshed out. In fact, maybe it might be your next book, uh, The Definition of a Western Conservative. I'm going to put you on the spot. What is a Western conservative? Yeah, I'll tell you what a Western conservative is. It's, it's somebody that can look up and enjoy the beautiful sky. Um, it's somebody that re recognizes that our rights are given to us by God, not the government. It's somebody who appreciates private property. And uh, while we have about 37% of the land owned in Colorado by the federal government, we still have private property rights and we are secure in our private property. And the government uh, has to go through a very uh, arduous process to infringe on those private property rights. It's, it's somebody that understands the meaning of liberty and self-reliance and, and personal accountability. Uh, and, and those Western conservatives uh, uh, really appreciate each other. And I don't consider California part of the West. And, and so when I had a conversation with President Trump not too long ago, uh, he asked me, you know, generally, is there anything else you'd like to talk about, Ken? And I said to President Trump, I said, I, I absolutely agree with you building a wall. If you would just make it between California and Colorado, I'd really appreciate that. Um, being from New York, I'm not sure that, that he fully uh, understood what I was trying to, to say to him, but uh, our state has been changed by people that uh, come from a state and come from a part of the country that uh, they are uh, all too comfortable with, with government uh, infringing on their rights because they believe they're receiving some benefit from government. When government offers you safety, they're taking liberty away from you. And we have to make sure that we're very cautious before we allow government to infringe on our, on our liberties. That's right. Uh, as you conclude the book, you do a great job of reminding us who we are of e pluribus unum, of our, our national mottos of, of, of uh, America, the beautiful, the poem, uh, and of personal responsibility. So how, uh, Congressman Buck, do we get back uh, to the founding of this nation that created the greatest nation in the history of the world? Well, Jeff, I think what we're seeing right now is, is a, uh, just a, a great contrast between those of us that, that believe in personal responsibility and, and believe in liberty and, and this count, cancel culture group out there that thinks that they should rewrite history, that, that if we can rewrite history, we can make America into a godless socialist country, that we can redistribute wealth, that we can engage in the kinds of, of progressive policies that, that undermine all of our constitutional principles. And, and those are the, the real dangers that we have to fight against. And so I, I'm, I'm hoping with this book, I can uh, clearly outline the policies that, that, that have made us great, the policies that our founders intended for us to live by, and uh, contrast that with uh, some of the rhetoric that's going on right now. Capital of Freedom, Restoring American Greatness will be out, available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, lots of different places, Walmart, August 4th, 2020. As progressives reject the Constitution to implement their socialist agenda, Congressman Ken Buck argues that we must reclaim our heritage of liberty by applying the principles we learned through the U.S. Capitol's art, architecture, and artifacts. Like I mentioned, he really is uh, the Nicolas Cage, national treasure, more important than any wealth. Uh, what we find in our capital can lead to a prosperous country for all people. Congressman Buck, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. God bless you for all the work that you're doing. I'll leave the final word to you. Well, thank you very much, Jeff. I hope people enjoy the book. I hope people uh, take advantage of some of the knowledge and come to the Capitol and see the features for themselves. I hope they come by my office or their, their uh, member of Congress's office and, and make sure 
uh, that they actually do talk to people about their, their grievances, their concerns, um, as well as the, the joys they have of, of being Americans. But Jeff, thank you, God bless you, and, and God bless Colorado Christian University and uh, your great institute for doing uh, such wonderful work and, and highlighting good things in this country. Thank you. Well, I, I did want to point out, you did mention Colorado Christian University in your book. I read this today to the president of CCU and the other vice presidents. You wrote, I've had the opportunity to sit in my office in the Rayburn House office building and visit with constituents about the merits or flaws of legislation. And, and I'm always impressed with their knowledge, not only of the bill text, but of the constitution. I'm reminded of meetings with students and faculty from Colorado Christian University. For instance, they always come well prepared having studied the issue such as religious freedom, the depth of their questions can even reach the rarefied level of trying to understand the unintended nuances, nuanced consequences of a US Supreme Court decision. Congressman Buck, you've been wonderful to Colorado Christian University. A number of our students have had a chance to intern with you. It's been a great experience for them. Thank you for the work you do for the people of Colorado. And as you mentioned, the People's House is open. So I hope our watchers will uh, get, a get a chance to come and visit you uh, in your congressional office soon and uh, hopefully get a tour from you. Well, I look forward to it. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. God bless you.